Innocent Lives Foundation is an organization that I started that is made up of security professionals that want to help save children from the horrors of child abuse. We use our skills to uncover and unmask those who try to anonymously hide online while spreading, producing, and profiting from child abuse material. So I just want to thank everybody for attending tonight's meeting, uh, November 16th. This is the Southwest Florida Security uh, or Swiffle Sec uh, community meeting. We meet monthly on the third Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, as you'll notice, it's about 6.41 p.m. now. We'll get started. We, we, we're not too formal around here. We'll uh, let people kind of trickle in around 6.30 or so and talk a little bit before we get started. But uh, uh, with that said, we'll get started now and we'll go through a few slides before we uh, turn it over to our uh, introduce our presenter and, and turn it over to him. Uh, but again, we're, we're Southwest Florida InfoSec community or SwiffleSec. Uh, we are located on the Paradise Coast, uh, serving the greater Naples, Fort Myer, Myers area. We're also the DEF CON group DC 239, and we're recognized as a Derby Con community group too. So here I'll just take a pause if everybody wants to whip out their phones and, you know, scan QR codes that you just don't know who they're from. You know, being a security group is always fun to, to throw this up there, uh, but it, it's convenient too, right? So as you'll see, uh, most of these are QR codes to uh, Swiffle Sex different uh, social media accounts, uh, our regular website there on the upper left, uh, besides Naples, which is our security conference, the first one we are organizing for 2022. Uh, hopefully in October, we've moved it a couple of times due to the pandemic and the uh, COVID and it blowing up and numbers changing and seems like daily. Uh, but hopefully things will settle down and, and October will be the, the month that we have it. Uh, so hopefully uh, for those who are interested, keep an eye on that website as we post more and more about the conference and start doing uh, call for sponsors, call for papers and stuff like that. Uh, probably start hitting that uh, later in the new year uh, or later once we hit the new year in, in January, we'll start uh, picking up steam there and to get ready for the October conference. We haven't landed on a venue yet, but we are looking at different uh, opportunities here in the area and uh, it'll be open to everybody. It'll be a small charge, uh, but nothing too extravagant. We want to keep it cheap so anybody can attend, uh, make it affordable for everyone. Um, and then uh, also our upper right corner, the QR code for Innocent Lives Foundation, who is our charity of choice that we uh, happily support them for everything they do. And in fact, uh, we've already talked with Shane, which I'll, I'll turn over to in a moment, uh, that besides Naples, uh, once we do have it, uh, any of our um, extra profits afterwards will be donated to Innocent Lives Foundation to support them. Uh, they are a, a not-for-profit organization, and I don't ever do it enough justice by describing it. That's why I love Shane being here, because uh, he can really describe it. And so with that, Shane, I'm going to turn it over to you for a moment. Thank you, sir. So if you're not familiar with us, the simple story is that we hunt child predators online. We do this uh, with the blessing and in cooperation with law enforcement. And uh, we work very closely with them. So there's no vigilante activity. And the goal is simply to identify these guys and gals who are hurting our children out there, figure out who they are in real life, and then turn them over to law enforcement in a, in a package that law enforcement can turn around and take action on. So if um, you are not a fan of child predators, I would encourage you to look us up. Thanks, Shane. And about how many cases are you up to now? I know we talked about that uh, a week or two ago, I think. 
we are 404, 404 um, that have been accepted by law enforcement. We have like 37 open cases right now. We've actually done over 500 cases. So, but currently 404 have been accepted by law enforcement. Yeah, that, that's amazing. The, the work that you all do to, to protect our kids. Uh, and, and two, uh, besides donating to ILF to help them out, um, what's the typical cost per, per case? So it can cost up to $10,000. We have several different case types, uh, but uh, $10,000 is what we typically talk about as far as per case in order to uh, begin the case, start it, see it, fruition, get it all reported, $10,000. Great. Uh, so there's multiple ways to donate. Um, one is a, just a one-off donation. Other ways is there's different, pro there's a program uh, which is called the HERO program, I think, if I'm right. Yes. It is. It's, yes. yes. Okay. It's, yeah. And then, uh, so that, and that has different levels. And, and in fact, you get a little, as, as a recurring donator for those different levels, you do get uh, a variety of different swag for helping out uh, and recognition uh, if you want it. Uh, there's recognition too. I see people uh, get to leave comments on there too when they make their donations and whatnot. Uh, so uh, really good organization. Um, like I said, it's our favorite charity. Personally, it's my favorite charity. And Try and think. I had one more item here. Uh, can can I of... can yeah, I show you guys something that's not been made public yet? This is part of the fun of being able to talk to you guys right here. Let me just right. a second. Okay. In the Hero Program, uh, you get a coin for donating at the six month mark. You get a coin for donating either $25, $50, or $100 a month. But once you've made your, your 12th donation, we have just rolled these bad boys out. And so um, this is the ILF one-year anniversary coin for donating, and it is gorgeous. So you guys saw it here first. Wow, that is pretty nice looking challenge coin there. And the three other challenge coins are shield shaped. They are. Hold on a second. Let's see if we can do this. There we go. So the uh, the twenty five dollar a month, the fifty dollar a month, and then the legend coin is a hundred or more. And as you can see, it actually has a cutout in it. And it says, thank you for being legendary. Yeah. So amazing stuff, Shane. Uh, is there any events coming up that you guys are participating in? We are. We're going to be in person uh, in Orlando on the 5th, starting on the 5th. And I'm going to get you the name of that conference in just a second. I apologize. I do not have it pulled up. That's all right, no big deal. You can uh, post the chat once you have it. So I, I kind of did a sneak attack on you with all these questions. So I, I don't uh, blame you for not being prepared. Uh, but great, so thanks so much Shane for, for providing the information. And I uh, just wanna say, go out and visit the ILF uh, Innocent Lives Foundation website. Uh, there's a lot of good information on there as well. Uh, write-ups about how to protect your kids and, and yourselves even, just talking about privacy and stuff too. So check them out. Uh, check them out on social media as well. Uh, and uh, YouTube. I think there's a YouTube channel, maybe. Yeah, there's a YouTube channel. So check them out. I'm going to progress the slides now. So in our area here in Southwest Florida, we are just a, a burgeoning ecosystem of tech groups. And uh, we have a lot more tech groups than I have represented here. I, I just grabbed a sample of the logos. Most of you who have been to these meetings in the past will recognize these logos. I haven't changed them for a while now. I probably need to swap a few out, swap a few in, just to mix things up a little bit. But we have the Southwest Florida Coders. So basically anything programming related, uh, they're your group. Uh, super friendly, super helpful. If you can, if it's a programming language, somebody there knows it. Uh, a large great group in the area. They are trying to get back, I think, to two meetings a month, uh, one of them generally being a presentation meeting and another one being the 
uh, kind of coders meeting where you can just come in and work on projects, get help from from different folks that are maybe experts in the programming language that you need, you, you have a question on. Uh, and they have a Slack group as well. And they're out there on various social media uh, platforms too. So if you're interested in programming, uh, certainly look them up. Southwest Florida Data, uh, anything data related? Uh, this is the group. Now, uh, right now, I think they're on a pause as they're searching for a co-leader to uh, take on a bit more of the, the daily running of the, of the group and, and get more presentations in. So you'll see if you look at uh, their page, uh, they don't have a, a meetup coming up. And uh, yeah, one, we hope that once they find another co-leader uh, to join them, that we'll start seeing a lot more activity. Uh, as we know, uh, data now is, is kind of like the new currency, right? It's, it's the new economy. It's, uh, you know, you need to protect it. And, um, you know, there's so many laws now and they're, they're growing every day that uh, it'd be good to know about um, even how to help out their uh, company and, and or even yourself in protecting your own data. Of course, for Southwest Florida Security, like I mentioned before, there's our logo. There's PyLady Southwest Florida, as well as Python Southwest Florida. They're uh, sister groups. And Inessa uh, runs those. And I don't think she joined us tonight, uh, but they do have a meetup coming up this Thursday. You'll see that on the next slide. And I think they generally meet once a month at least. If you're interested in Python, certainly check them out. There's OWASP here in Bonita Springs. That's our sister group, uh, which I co-lead with uh, Steven, who I saw join us earlier. And our next meetup for that will be the first Tuesday of January, 2022. So watch for that announcement to come up uh, and, and a topic hopefully to, to present on. So we'll see how that goes as we get closer to January. Then there's uh, VR and AR Southwest Florida, who Evie runs, and uh, they've been generally having a meetup every month as well. So certainly just picking up, picking up speed, depending on which, which analysts you, you, you read or follow, right? And some people say VR is dead again, uh, and other people are saying, no, it's, it, it, it's growing. Um, certainly, I know the company I'm working for is looking into doing a lot more with, with virtual reality, augmented reality. And um, when we had uh, the group here, VR and AR of Southwest Florida, do a meeting recently where they did a showcase of uh, companies here in Southwest Florida that are using the technology. Uh, it's just amazing what people are doing with it. So check them out sometime. Southwest Florida Open Source is another uh, meetup group here uh, that are dedicated to open source movement and looking to help the community and educate them in open source, how to run an open source um, program, how to um, commit stuff to open source, how to, how to work with other groups and, and stuff and also looking to work with the, the general uh, communities here in the area, even, even working with local governments too, and, and doing open source uh, projects. That one is another one too, that's looking for a co-leader to help, um, help them run uh, more often, help them run meetings more often. So uh, certainly if you're interested in open source, reach out and that community leader uh, is available. You can hit them up on their meetup page uh, and they'll follow up with you. A WordPress meetup of Southwest Florida is a, a large WordPress group here in the area, and they've been doing a lot of regular meetups uh, lately too, where they're bringing in other WordPress groups from, from outside the area on multiple topics. So if you're interested in WordPress, check them out. And Southwest Florida Tech is, uh, used to be called Regional Technology Partnership of Southwest Florida, lar larger name. So it's good to see them switch to a smaller name. It's, uh, easier to remember, I think, but uh, they're here to promote technology here in Southwest Florida. Uh, they run a couple of events throughout the year, one of them being a career fair at, at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University, which I believe just happened. And they'll have a couple other events throughout the year too, where they bring in speakers or, or do tours of, of companies and whatnot. And like I said, oh, and like I said, there's other groups that just aren't represented here, uh, but certainly uh, check it out. If you're here in Southwest Florida, check out the meetup um, activity and meetup.com, meetup.org, meetup.com. Meetup and uh, you'll see that there's just a variety of technology groups here in the area. I mean, everybody's very friendly and helpful and, you know, just looking to, 
to raise the bar and raise technology here in Southwest Florida, which seems to be a, a forgotten area uh, here uh, for technology. So uh, moving on to upcoming events. So we have a, a good list here of a variety of different things. A lot of to be determined this time. I think by this meeting kind of hit in the middle of other, other meetup groups uh, scheduling. So unfortunately this time, a lot of to be determined, but again, check out their meetup pages. Uh, we do see Pi Lady Southwest Florida will be coming up here this Thursday, uh, 7.30 p.m. And like I said, OWASP Bonita Springs on January 4th at 6.30. Uh, Hack Miami is this Saturday, November 20th at 2 p.m. And then the ISSA South Florida chapter, uh, again, they're on Thursday, Thursday too, but the good thing is they're earlier than Pi Lady Southwest Florida, so you could probably hit both meetings if you're interested. Uh, also check out Isaka, Isaka South Florida uh, through that website there. And OWA South Florida is to be determined. Uh, they're probably on a similar schedule to us. We, we in this area, we move to uh, quarterly meetings. So we typically, for, for OWA Bonita Springs, we'll typically have our meetups right now on a uh, first Tuesday. Sorry, I gotta admit a couple of people here. So first Tuesday of the of the month of the first month of the quarter. So I know it's a little complex to remember, uh, but certainly keep an eye on our website, keep an eye on our meetup page, and we'll post when those are. Uh, so yeah, again, OWA South Florida, they're on a similar schedule where they're meeting quarterly too. So keep an eye on their website and meetup. So right now I'll just take a quick pause. This is where we ask the the audience here, uh, tell us your needs. Uh, we're here to help you, uh, whether that's if you're seeking a job, you're seeking to hire somebody, you have some other needs related to cybersecurity, uh, privacy, InfoSec, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'll take a pause here and, and let you all take it over. Hey, everybody, I'm Richard. Yeah, I'm just uh, finishing up my degree, just trying to get a job. So if anybody knows where I could get, I guess, an entry level role, that would be really helpful. Thanks, Richard. And where are you located? Are you here in Southwest Florida? Yeah, I'm in Naples. Okay. Uh, and where are you finishing your degree up? Uh, Hodges. Okay, great. Yeah, they have a cyber cybersecurity program there. I, I'm assuming you're finishing up in cybersecurity. Uh, it's I'm doing computer science for the associates, and then I'm going to switch over probably either to cybersecurity or maybe IT management. I'm not sure. All right, great. Thanks. So if anybody has uh, any information for Richard, feel free to, to send the chat his way. Thanks, Richard. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Well, not hearing anybody else at the moment, I'm going to uh, tell my need. I, I So as I mentioned earlier, I work here in Southwest Florida. I do work for the largest uh, medical device manufacturer here in this area as well, named Arthrex. And we have we do have several uh, job openings from level one, entry level, uh, as well as intern. Uh, this is the season for where we start opening internships up uh, to get ready for uh, the spring when, when students can do their internships usually. So uh, Richard, feel free to check out our page at careers.arthrex.com. And I'll drop the link there in chat and anyone else too. Uh, we have job openings from level one entry level type jobs uh, all the way up to the more senior positions, uh, all in IT, um, whether it's infrastructure, uh, business analyst, uh, programmers, DevOps, cloud, networking. Uh, we're a growing company and we're always looking for additional talent. So um, like I said, I'll drop out or I'll drop that link into uh, the chat so anybody who's interested can take a look at that. Uh, careers.arthrex.com. So I'll take one more pause to see if anybody else has something they want to mention before moving on. All right, so that was enough time for me to type stuff into the chat. And hearing nothing else, I'll go ahead and get us started on the next slide before we turn it over to our speaker for the night. So just, I used to have this at the as the last slide after the speaker and, and realized we would never get to it because usually after our presentation, we have a bit of banter at the end and and uh, things just typically uh, go a different direction. So I thought I'll move this slide up before I turn it over to our speaker tonight. So 
Uh, I just want to say Southwest Florida InfoSec community, thanks to following Innocent Lives Foundation for everything you do in the community uh, around the U.S., uh, hopefully eventually expanding to the uh, globally, maybe one day. Um, but just everything you do to help protect our children and, and protect the public and, and educate uh, people on how they can protect their families. Uh, it's really appreciated. Uh, our speaker tonight is Jim Wales. I'll, hopefully I pronounced your name right, Jim. Uh, I'll turn it over to Jim here in a moment. He'll introduce himself. So I just thank him right now uh, for spending his time with us tonight, uh, sharing his expertise and uh, hopefully educating us a little bit in digital forensics. Uh, our members, uh, all of you who joined tonight, just a big, huge thank you for spend, for sharing your time with us as well. Because uh, without you, uh, civil sec just wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be successful. Uh, as you all come out here every month, it just gives us uh, continued joy to be able to share with the community and give back and have these network opportunities, have these training opportunities. And we're an open organization, uh, an open special interest group, if you will. Uh, we are uh, open to the public. Anybody can come, whether you're in the industry or not, just have an interest, just hang out with us for a little while. A little while. Who knows, you might find something that you really like and you wanna pursue. Uh, you might find a job opportunity or, or some other networking opportunity, but thank you so much for coming out. And then uh, the Southwest Florida Community Organizations who I listed on a previous slide, I, they selflessly operate to lift others here in the community. Uh, again, all those ones I listed in that previous slide, uh, they're free open groups here in Southwest Florida. They're here to help others and just educate and drive awareness or provide networking opportunities. So just a, a, a big thank you to our community here and the groups and, and their leaders too. So with that, I'm gonna move on to our speaker. Everybody's here waiting for, uh, you don't wanna to listen to me, you wanna to listen to Jim tonight. So Jim, I'm gonna turn hosting over to you. And with that, uh, you can take over sharing too. So I'll stop, I'll even stop sharing here as I get prepared. All right, Jim, that should be all yours now. Okay, all right, thanks, Mike. Um, let me uh, begin by uh, saying, Shane, I really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing at Innocent Lives Foundation. That's uh, really important work um, in the time that I've been doing uh, law enforcement, uh, digital forensics. Um, there's not, over the last six years, I, I've seen a lot, and not, not too much shocks me um, anymore. But one thing that continues to shock me every day is just the, the the volume, the, the absolute staggering numbers of uh, perpetrators and, and victims that are out there committing these crimes. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to completely wrap my head around that. Um, so the work that you're doing uh, is extremely valuable. Um, so thank you for what you're doing. And I would actually really like to talk to you one-on-one -on -one later uh, about how I might be able to help out with that. Um, thank you, sir. Yeah, let's, let's definitely follow up. Yeah. So um, thank you all for uh, having me this evening. Um, this is not something I do regularly. I'm uh, not a, a particularly polished presenter. So, and I'm not very good at watching the chat. So if somebody has something to ask me or to comment on, or if there's a chat that I, or a question in the chat that I miss or something like that, somebody please holler at me because I'm not good at, at uh, paying attention to, to that part of it. Um, most of the time when I'm talking to groups of people, they're groups of 12 and uh, they're sitting in a jury box and they're legally obligated to listen to me. So uh, it's really nice of you guys to show up and <laughs> voluntarily listen to what I have to say this evening. So I appreciate it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll jump right in here. And uh, as soon as I can get the slideshow up and running, um, bear with me, I told you guys I'm not good at this. Uh, yeah, no, no worries at all, Jim, and I'll keep an eye on the chat for you. Okay, I appreciate that, Mike. Um, all right, you got there it? Go. You got it? Got it. All right, cool. Okay, so my presentation this evening is going to be about digital forensics, but specifically digital forensics within law enforcement, because law enforcement is kind of a little bit of a different animal um, when it comes to doing digital forensics, as opposed to what happens in the private sector and government sector. Um, it's not really about uh, incident response so much as it is investigating crimes. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple of definitions throughout the presentation and talk about why I feel like the uh, 
the definitions uh, don't quite meet exactly what it is that we do in law enforcement. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 19 years, uh, about 19 and a half actually at this point, and 13 of those years I've been a detective. Um, I've been a digital forensic examiner for six years. Um, I've done over 500 examinations of different devices, uh, everything from cell phones to computers, uh, uh, lots of different operating systems, um, lots of thumb drives, uh, external drives, uh, just anything I can get my hands on really. Uh, I haven't had a chance to do a drone yet. I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to do that someday. Um, I've even done some vehicle infotainment uh, forensics, which is uh, kind of cool sometimes. Um, I do have multiple certifications in both computer and mobile forensics. Um, and uh, uh, some, of the, some of the training that I have uh, doesn't even offer certifications uh, quite yet. So, uh, so what is digital forensics? Um, and this is what I was talking about with the definition. Um, so NIST, you can see, you know, everybody can read. Um, so you can see how they, how they define digital forensics. Um, but I wanna break this down just a little bit. Um, because I wanna talk about how it applies to law enforcement. So you know, specifically they say that it's uh, following proper search authority. Well, that of course in law enforcement is extremely important because we either have to have a search warrant or we have to have consent um, or the third uh, situation that comes up frequently that uh, often people don't uh, think about is if we have an owner of uh, devices that is deceased, uh, which we run across quite often uh, in uh, homicide cases. Um, Chain of custody is paramount uh, because of the issue of fruit of the poisonous tree. If we cannot account for how we came into possession of that uh, evidence item and all the hands that it has uh, changed through during the course of the investigation, everything that's been done with it, um, then we can't use it in court. It's, it's of no value to the, to the prosecution. Um, the other thing that is uh, a very important issue with that is the fact that digital uh, images, so, and I don't mean by, I don't mean pictures, I mean forensic images of these digital devices are accepted by the courts as original evidence. So if I have a computer, if I have a, a mobile device and I image a hard drive or I image a mobile device, that image is accepted by the court as original evidence. So that also means that that is an evidence item. So that's an additional item that we need to maintain a chain of custody for, otherwise it can't be used in court. Uh, validation with mathematics, uh, really what they're talking about there as far as, as I understand it um, is hashing algorithms. We use hashing algorithms every single day, multiple times a day to validate the integrity of the evidence set that we're working with um, so that we can then later testify uh, when we're called to in court that the data that we are working with is the same as the original data and we have a methodology that we can use to verify that. Um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of talk within the forensic community about uh, validation of that and the, and the integrity of the uh, the evidence and the hashing algorithms that sometimes get used, especially when people talk about the use of the MD5 uh, hashing algorithm, because it is known that that is not a secure hashing algorithm anymore. Um, but in terms of the way that it's used within law enforcement, it is still very valid for for verifying the integrity of an evidence item because the chances of a, uh, of a collision uh, occurring, and so what, if you don't know what a collision is, um, the chances of two pieces of evidence, two pieces of data, randomly having the same uh, MD5 hash value by chance. Now, now I'm not talking about it that gets forced if somebody uses rainbow tables or you know, some, sort of, some sort of attack by a birthday attack or something like that. But it, by just by chance, it's something like 340 billion 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 to one. And when you start using things like a SHA, uh, like a SHA one or a, a SHA 256 algorithm, the numbers get astronomically higher. So we use those hashing algorithms all the time to to validate the integrity of the evidence that we're working with. Uh, the use of validated tools that uh, that definitely is something that. Uh, we do all the time. We make sure that we validate that our tools are working in the way that they should. Uh, repeatability. Uh, we've had situations where we've had examiners get sick, um, examiners uh, get injured, and they haven't been able to, uh, to testify. So somebody needs to be able to go in and repeat the same exam that they did and verify the results that were 
achieved by the first examiners that then can then go and testify to the validity of that examination. Uh, reporting, we do a lot of reporting. We report on every single exam that we do. And we don't always have to, to go in and testify about every examination that we do, um, but we do have to report on everything that we do. And then we do frequently have to uh, provide uh, expert witness uh, testimony. Um, so that is something that's common. Um, one thing that uh, the NIST uh, definition doesn't mention that is very prevalent within law enforcement uh, digital forensics is peer review. Um, that is something that we do on a regular basis to make sure that we have all of our bases covered um, and that we haven't missed anything. And I think that that bears mentioning uh, because it is so important because we're talking about people's lives and freedom on the line. Um, EC Council uh, offers another definition uh, that's uh, quite a bit more simple than the NIST uh, definition uh, that you can see there. And the only issue that I have with, uh, with the EC Council definition that they offer is that it specifically says that, it's, that this is activity that's done um, related to cyber crime. And that's not necessarily the case in, uh, in law enforcement forensics. Uh, because law enforcement forensics is used to investigate pretty much any crime that you can think of. Uh, the majority of the cases that we work are the uh, are violent crimes, so homicides, aggravated assaults, armed robberies. Uh, we work a lot of the cases that are the uh, the child exploitation cases, the internet crimes against children cases, um, and, uh, and pretty much any other violent crime that you can think of. We work a lot of narcotics cases. We work hit and run cases. Uh, to try and uh, determine what was going on with somebody uh, that was operating the vehicle in a, in a hit and run case or in a uh, fatality accident case as well. So uh, those are all situations that wouldn't normally be defined as cybercrime, um, but it's uh, very, uh, that, those are the cases that we work on and those are the cases that we use digital forensics to, uh, to help investigate. So digital forensics and law enforcement is really, for the most part, um, can be summarized in the need for the identification of digital evidence. And the reason I uh, have these pictures up here is these are all USB thumb drives or you know, USB flash drives um, that are kind of odd. They can easily be missed. So a lot of what we do is to go out on search warrants with investigators and help them go through these scenes and try to identify devices that may contain digital evidence. Um, a lot of these uh, can easily be missed. Uh, we help with the collection of these, uh, these items. Um, so things like uh, working on a computer, if there's a computer in, uh, in a residence that a search warrant is being served in and there's potential for evidence to be on that computer, we don't want the detectives just to go in there and start shutting these computers down or pulling power to them because we do have the ability to capture that volatile memory, that RAM, and there can be valuable evidence within that. So we wanna make sure that we are there to assist them in the capture of that evidence before those systems are shut down. Uh, we also preserve the evidence. So we uh, make sure that it's being stored in a manner that is going to preserve it until it can be examined. And then afterward, uh, for as long as it needs to be uh, to maintain the chain of custody as well, um, because there is a pellet process that we need to be cognizant of. Uh, we do the analysis of the evidence and then uh, the reporting on the evidence. Hey, Jim, just so, real quick. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Oh, no, please. Uh, so uh, with, with you having a uh, host right now, we may have people wanting to join uh, as you're speaking. And if you watch the oh. participants list, they'll get a waiting room notification. Uh, okay. if, you, if you could uh, do the admits if anything happens. I know that's one additional item to have you uh, watch, so I, I apologize for that. Um, oh, no, that's all right. Um, but just yeah, just for your awareness. Anybody. Okay. And then I had Is a quick anybody... question. If you... Sorry, go ahead. Is there anybody waiting in there now? I haven't missed anyone, have I? I can't see from my end because I'm not the host now. So if you looked at the participants list, uh, you would see right oh, at the top yep. of the list people right. waiting. Okay, yeah. Like Dan is waiting. Dan, uh, that was uh, sorry to keep you waiting. That was my mistake. I'm not used to running these. 
and, and if you don't mind, do you are you okay with people asking you questions as you're presenting, or do you want to hold questions until the end? Oh my gosh, yes, jump right in if you want to. It doesn't bother me a bit. All right, so quick question then uh, on your previous slide with the thumb drives, and you talked yeah. about uh, collecting that evidence and and uh -huh. having somebody there who can uh, look at the scene and maybe spot stuff there. Uh, I've seen a lot uh, recently in, in the feeds that I that I have of where there are now, and maybe it's existed for a while and I'm just now seeing it. Uh, there are canine units now that are electronic canine units there, then they can sniff out these things too. Yeah, uh, we, we actually have one uh, with our, with our uh, unit, our, the unit that, uh, is, that does this with my department. Um, uh, his name is Hunter and he's awesome. Great. Uh, what's really interesting about those those dogs is, is how just how good they are. Uh, so we're pretty fortunate, and the the location where we are. Um, and I know that I didn't mention this, so for anybody uh, that's that's watching that is curious about this. Um, so I, I work in a major metropolitan police department in the Midwest. Um, I'm not mentioning the name of the police department that I work for uh, or any of the other agencies that I support, um, not because it's a secret. Uh, later on, I'm going to give you my LinkedIn uh, address, um, so you can look me up if you want to. I'm not, I'm not hiding anything, um, but I don't mention them in this, especially because it's being recorded, because I have to jump through hoops with my department to make sure that uh, I'm that if I use their name, then I'm you know, allowed to represent them uh, in this presentation and uh, that's not why I'm here. I'm just here trying to share uh, some of my experience and what I know. I'm not trying to represent my uh, my department uh, by doing this. Um, so, like I said, I'm I'm not going to mention their name, but it's no secret. If you want to look me up, feel free. So, yeah, we're really fortunate where we are with the dogs because one of the very best trainers in the world for those dogs uh, lives about an hour from where I am, and we are very fortunate to have the opportunity for a lot of the officers that come in from all around the, all around the country and sometimes from around the world uh, who train with these animals to come to our area to train. So when we go out and we serve search warrants every once in a while, we'll have four or five or six of these dogs that are coming to our search warrants as training events. Um, and we've seen some amazing finds. Uh, they, they can find something as small as a micro SD card uh, that you would look right past. Uh, there we, I was out on a search warrant uh, just a couple weeks ago now, and there was a, a big suitcase that had smaller bags inside the suitcase, and the bags were full of all kinds of just random stuff. And we, we're digging through all this stuff, and, it, and the house is a mess. you got to understand some of these houses that we go into, they're not very clean. Uh, they're very, very cluttered. And so as you're looking through the stuff, it's, it's easy to miss something that's as small as an SD or a micro SD card. And in this instance, we did. I looked through a bag and I was trying to get through things and I, I looked right past it. It was buried under something else. Well, Hunter, our electronic detection canine came in and he found it. Um, so, you know, good for him. He beat me that day. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to let him do that. Now, they're, they're amazing, amazing animals. Yeah, so, so he gets the treat for the day. Absolutely. I was, he gets the treat anyway, because because I mean, he's just better looking than I am. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for answering that question, by the way. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and everybody just feel free to jump in anytime you want, because um, I'm, I'm not opposed to being uh, interrupted. So. All right. So Taylor asks in chat. Uh, you, you, I know you mentioned edutainment a little earlier. Have you, mm -hmm. have you conducted uh, digital forensics on a car yet? Yes, I have. Uh, I've done, uh, I don't think I'm up to three or four cars now. And cars are interesting uh, because the, um, the forensics that we do on those, so this is not the black box forensics that like our accident uh, investigators do. This is the, uh, this is, forensics on the infotainment system. So basically what's uh, replaced the stereo uh, in modern cars, you know, it's that single head unit that's got all your, uh, your climate controls and it's got all the audio controls and uh, it's got your GPS map and everything, all that's built into it. We're able to, with some vehicles, and it depends on the tools that are available at the time, 
Um, so for some of the vehicles, we're able to, to gather quite a bit of information off of those. Um, the hard part about that is that it's not like um, it's not like working on an iPhone where you know there's a few you know there's really not that many different models of iPhones in the in the grand scheme of things. So, you know, so working across them, it doesn't matter really whether it's T-Mobile or Verizon or you know, who the carrier is. The hardware is what the hardware is. Well, with these cars. Um, a lot of that stuff is proprietary. You've got stuff that's made by Ford, you've got stuff that's made by GM, and then you've got all the other car manufacturers out there. Um, and then you've got these companies that make tools that allow us to do the digital forensics on those, which is awesome, but they've got a team of people who are taking those that hardware and they're reverse engineering everything and figuring out how to get the data off of there, which is fantastic when they can get to it. Um, but there's a lot of cars that they haven't gotten to yet. There's a lot of cars that they haven't had the time to, to reverse engineer everything on. And even if they're caught up with whatever that car is, the next time they do a major uh, remodel on whatever the model of that car is, um, for instance, that there was a, a Nissan truck that uh, was involved in a, in a series of crimes uh, just last year. And I was looking at that and they had great support uh, for every year up to that year but in that year of that vehicle they had done a major remodel so everything was brand new and nobody had had time to get their hands on that on one of those vehicles and to pull that head unit out and to then reverse engineer everything and figure out how to get all the data off of it so i missed it by one year that one wasn't wasn't supported but for the cars that are supported sometimes we can get great information we can get information about uh where the car has been from the from some of the GPS information, what devices have connected to it, when calls were made, when calls were received, text messages that went back and forth, even stuff as, as detailed as when the doors were locked and unlocked, when they were open and closed, when, do, when windows went up and down, when the car accelerated, when it decelerated, how hard it accelerated or decelerated. Uh, some of these uh, vehicles have got tons of data. Some of them have none. We can't get anything. So that's really kind of a, a roll of the dice sometimes. All right, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's like no, no additional questions at the moment. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to get away from the uh, from the the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to do death by PowerPoint for anybody, but I'm not fancy enough to do it any other way. Um, I'm going to do a live demonstration for you guys. Uh, and I, I, please forgive me if I'm offending anybody by using guys. Uh, that's just how I talk. Um, that's I, I certainly don't mean to offend anybody if, if, uh, if that's not your pronoun of choice. Um, uh, I've been talking this way for over 40 years and it's really hard to change it. So uh, I certainly don't mean to offend anyone. So what I'm gonna do is I've got this massive uh, 256 uh, meg thumb drive and I tried to find the smallest thumb drive that I could find to do this with so we can do it quickly. And I'm gonna use a uh, free tool called FTK Imager um, that uh, is gonna make a forensic image of this device. And then I'm going to import that image into another tool called Autopsy, which is also another free tool that, um, that can work cross-platform. And I, I've tried really hard to make sure that I only use tools that are free and that work cross-platform. So whether you're using Linux, whether you're using uh, Mac or Windows, these tools will work on these systems so that if you wanna download these yourself, um, if you wanna repeat what, what I've done here and try to play with this and learn with it, I, I, I wanted to make sure that you, that you were able to do that if that was something interesting to you. So um, I'm gonna make this image and we're gonna pull it into FTK. We're gonna look at it. I put a few files on here. I did some different things with them and we're gonna see what that looks like. Um, and then I'm, at the very end, I'm gonna show you uh, how on a Windows system, um, and I didn't wanna get into too many different operating systems, so I'm just keeping it strictly to Windows, but on a Windows system where you can look and see where you can find evidence as to whether or not a USB device has been connected to a Windows computer. So with that, I will go ahead and get out of the presentation and we will open up can you guys still see my screen? Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, so we're just gonna open FTK Imager. And again, this is a free tool um, that anybody can download for no cost. They just ask for your, uh, 
just for your email address. Um, and there is a version of this that you can run from a USB drive or from an external drive. It's called the FTK Imager Lite. Um, so if you want to do this on a, a system that is running um, that you want to get the, uh, the operating system imaged on it. So whatever drive the OS is running on, if you want to do that, um, it's a bootable drive. And then you're able to, uh, to run the tool from there um, to, to get that image. So we're going to go ahead and connect this. USB drive. Add the drives. And we're in data traveler. All right. And then it shows you the hex of that. Everybody still hear me okay? I'm getting squawked out about my internet connection not being stable. Okay. All right. Good. So then we're going to image this. Again, it's a physical drive. Navigate over to where that is. And then we have to tell it where to where to send it. And the first thing it asks us when we're going to ask when it asks us where to where we want our uh, image drive to end up is it's going to ask us what kind of image drive do we want it to be. So you can do a raw DD, a smart EO1 or AFF. Um, I'm just going to do a raw DD uh, image of this. Um, I normally like to work uh, with EO1 when I'm actually working a case because I like to be able to rely on those the CRC values, the cyclical redundancy check values, um, so to make sure that the segments of that are uh, are verified. Um, but in the interest of speed and time for this evening, we're just going to do a raw image, and then we're just going to make up a case number. So let's see. Today's the 16th, so we'll just say 20. Oops, 2021. 16 is what we'll call our case number. We'll call our evidence number 01. Unique description is our Kingston USB drive. And I'm going to, me, uh, this is a drive. Super detailed. All right, so then it's going to ask us where we want this to go. Now, I already made a presentation notes there, and I just made a folder called FTK images. So we're just going to throw it in there. It wants to know what our file name is going to be, so we're just going to say the drive, you can name that whatever you want to. Normally, I, I'll name those uh, to, to indicate something about the case number that I'm working on so that when I go back and I look at the image files, I know what case it's associated with. But for this demonstration, uh, this is the only one we're doing, so that's easy. Um, and then you, there's some other uh, things that you can pick in here that you can pick the fragment size. You can add encryption to it if you want to. All of these things take extra processing, um, extra time. So we're just going to leave that as it is. And hit finish. You want to verify the image after it's created? Yes, I do. Um, that's going to check the hash values of the image. Um, and then you can pre-calculate the progress statistics, statistics, excuse me, statistics if you want to. Um, that doesn't take much extra time with something this small. Um, so there we go. There's our progress. This goes pretty quick. I wouldn't want to keep you guys here all night watching a taskbar tick by. Um, so this, you can see this goes pretty quick, but keep in mind, this is only 256 megs and it's a USB 2 drive. Is there somebody had a question? No? Okay. So then there's your, your verify results. So it gives you your MD5 hash and your SHA-1 hash. Um, for those, it gives you a you computed hash. So what this is doing, it's running the hash algorithm across the drive, uh, the, the actual physical drive, and then it runs that same hashing algorithm across your resulting image, and it tells you whether or not they match. So it's doing that with both MD5 and SHA-1. 
tells you whether or not you had any bad blocks. And in this case, we don't. Um, then gives you your name of your image and then your sector count. Okay, so you've got that. And then you can do this image summary, which gives you some additional information I'm not gonna spend very much time on this because this is some of what we already talked about, but what I do wanna show you is where the image is. So here's your 001 file right here is your, this is your DD file. So this is your actual image. So 200, so it's a 256 uh, meg drive, so 249 kilobytes. So uh, that, that aligns pretty closely with what what you have. And then the other thing that's interesting here is that it, it gives you a report, it gives you this text document that you can then look at. And I want to draw your attention to this because we're going to circle back to this in, in just a little bit. It gives you a lot of information about the drive, but one thing that's going to be of real importance to us for later for our evidence is this serial number. So most of these drives, if not all of them, uh, you will have a serial number that's associated with the, with the USB drive. And that's a value because you can then use that to try and attribute that USB device to with connection to a computer uh, later on. So from here, we're huh? just going to go in. Oh, go ahead. No. Okay. So we're going to open autopsy. All right, I'm going to start a new. Case, got a case piece of this E drive that I use. Um, now, something that I want to mention here: if you if you get into forensics, or if you're interested in getting into forensics, and if you're interested in a forensics machine, some of these tools are going to care more about. They're going to run better if you have. A, a fast processor and a lot of cores. Some of them are going to run better or faster if you have a lot of RAM. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is to learn about the tool that you're gonna use, understand how the tool functions, and then set your system up for it to be able to, uh, to function as well as you can. Uh, in this particular system that I'm running, this is my personal machine that I use at, at, at home for everything, um, but I, set it up so that I could use it for forensics if I wanted to. So it's got an operating system drive that's completely separate. I've got a data storage drive that's completely separate. That's a, that's a platter drive. Um, the operating system is an SSD. And then I've got a second storage drive that I use for the temp files and for the indexing files that is a, uh, an SSD. And I, I do that because I want the processor to not have to be going across the same bus constantly um, to, this, to the same drive. Uh, when it's trying to access the index uh, for the searches that I do within the software. Um, and I know that may be confusing, probably don't have enough time to get into that in detail, um, but just understand that it's important to understand how your forensics tools function um, so that you can make sure that you're configuring your hardware, your hardware in the best way that you can to make them function as, as well as they can. Um, if you buy a... Uh, a if, if you get a, a higher level of uh, autopsy than just the free option, then you can get into this multi-user uh, area where you can have more than one investigator using this. Uh, but for this free version, the single user is the only thing that's available. So we're gonna throw our case in there and it's gonna create the case for us. Let's know what our case number is again. And then it's going to ask for some information about who the examiner is, and uh, it's going to throw the, it's going to have this information stored so that it can be put into the reporting for later. When I hit finish, it'll create the case. And that's for a source type. So it's asking, it's, we're asking, it's asking us to add data to the to the case because it doesn't have anything in it right now. now you can either do that here. Uh, or if you make a mistake here, you can get back. Uh, 
back to it here. So this is the, um, the, you can pick from any of these different types, but we're working with a disk image or, or a VM file. We're working with a disk image specifically. Um, and then it, we need to tell it there's one that's the same area that I showed you earlier where the image was. So we're going to pick this. We're going to add this to our case. It's going to ask us things about um, the time zone that we're in, sector size. Um, we can enter in hash values. Um, MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-256 if we want to, that it'll verify against, but we don't have those right now. We're not going to worry about that. And then this is where the ingest happens. So the way that autopsy works is it's got all these different modules that it's going to run, all these different tasks that it's going to run. And these are, these are all uh, things that you can pick and choose. The more of these you pick, the more time it's going to take to process your evidence. The less you pick or the more specific you get, um, the less time it's going to take to process that because it's doing fewer things like this DJI drone analyzer. Told you guys that I've never done a drone. Uh, still haven't done one yet. It's, there's nothing about a drone on this thumb drive, so we don't need to look at that. So you can go through and you can pick all this stuff out. And then once you've picked what you want to be, uh, to be run against the data set that you have, then you just hit next. Now, for a larger data set, I would want to be more specific in what I pick, but this is such a small data set that we're just going to move on um, so that we can do it. So from here, we just hit finish. And then here in the bottom right, it's going to give you some information about what it's doing. Now, we didn't provide the software with any uh, known hash sets. And we can do that. Like if we have a list of, of uh, say, illicit images that we know that we already have hash values for, and we want to check across this data set and see if any of those exist in this particular data set, we can tell the software to do that and it will tag those for us. Um, we have also a notable hash set. So we have known and notable. We can do both of those separately. Um, and then it's also telling us that, uh, that there are encrypted files uh, or an, an archive that were detected. So that's of interest to us because if we're doing a, an investigation where we're looking for evidence, somebody putting encryption on an archive file uh, indicates that somebody's trying to hide something, right? So. That's good information for us to have. And then if you go over into the left side hand or left hand side here, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can look at the data that's been presented to you or it's been processed for you. Um, you can look at the look at it by extension. Um, you can look at it by mime type. Um, a lot of times uh, for the for the exploitation cases that we that we work, these image files uh, are something that we can go to uh, and, and quickly uh, find what we're looking for. Um, you can look for deleted files. So this is showing that some of these, there are some deleted files here. There's a file system that's been deleted. Uh, there's been five files that were found to show that, that show that they've been deleted, um, that were recovered by the software. Um, encryption's been detected. so. There's our, there's our uh, archive file that is encrypted with, a, with a, that nondescript name, you know, super secret stuff dot zip. Uh, that's not suspicious at all, right? Um, there's, we're not gonna decrypt that here, um, but it lets us know that there's something there. So we can go into the, uh, we can go into the archive and we can see what the names of these files are uh, but it's not going to allow us to decrypt that here. Um, you can still go back and look at that later. You can load your image into a VM uh, if you think that you know what your password is for that encrypted container, or if you want to do some other cool things like try and uh, brute force that, or uh, if you've got the time for that. Um, but I just wanted to show you guys that it will detect encryption, um, and it will show you uh, which items are, are encrypted. So if we go into our images here, it'll show us that uh, we've got these kind of one at a time. And what I wanted to do here is I wanted to show um, that you can see which files have been deleted 
because they've got this red X. And what I decided was I was just going to make pictures of trees, our bad files here, just so that they all kind of have a theme. So you can see that you've got pictures of trees. And if pictures of trees are illegal wherever you are, and those are illicit files because for whatever reason, trees are illegal, um, then you can see that there are pictures of these trees and they've all been deleted. You can get some additional information on those. There's other ways that you can review the files within the software that make it a little bit easier. And then they categorize some other things. That we don't have things like communications, geolocation. It'll build a timeline for you. Um, for this data set, uh, that's not really uh, a lot of, we don't really have a lot of that. Um, there are some documents that it found. There's one, one office document. It's a Word document that I threw onto the drive just to show that it'll identify those plain text. And it'll look for executables. Um, so that, that probably is much more applicable to the types of cases that might be worked for uh, what would typically be called cyber crimes. Um, so you can see that you can use it for those like the corporate type investigations if you're trying to find malware, uh, something like that. Um, those executables can be identified by the software. Hi, Jim. Just a, a quick yeah. question. So yeah. and last time I looked at it, at, it at um, <clears throat> sorry, the, the tool that you're you're showing here. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're showing where you could see if the tool detected the images by extension. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes your uh, the the investigation that you're looking into, maybe the the person has renamed uh, the file to a different extension, so it doesn't show up there. Um, is yeah. that where you would use MIME type SAT? So uh, the MIME type would still detect an, an image even if it doesn't show up by extension. It could, and then there's also another module that you can run within the software, and I apologize, I already closed down uh, the, the window, um, but you can run a module within there for, uh, for the uh, file extension mismatch or file signature mismatch. And what that does is it evaluates the header and footer information of the file and compares that to the extension that's with the file, and it will notify you whether or not the extension that is listed for that file matches that header information so if you have like a JPEG file, but it's got an extension on it for like, a, uh, like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that, it'll tell you that that, ex that file extension does not match that header information because that's kind of an old school way that a lot of people used to try and hide a lot of the illicit image files was to just, they thought they could get away with just changing that extension. Um, and it used to be back in the day a lot harder to, to go through and, and look at all this because you had to actually go in and, and look at the hex of the of each file that you thought might might be that and look at that header information manually. Uh, but that automation has been built into the forensics tools where it will actually check on that for you automatically. Um, and then you can very quickly go through and, and check that yourself to make sure that it, it is not a false positive. Um, and make sure that uh, what you're dealing with is uh, whatever you think it might be. Right. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right, yeah, of course. All right, so, um, so I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint here because we've done our live demonstration. Oh man, okay. One thing that I failed to mention uh, before I did the live demonstration was uh, the importance of write blockers. So we want to make sure that we don't change the data, and that's one of the that's one of the first rules of doing forensics, and especially forensics and law enforcement, is that we we make sure that we don't change the data. So just connecting the device to your forensic workstation uh, can change the data. It can uh, can write to it. So in order to prevent that, we use write blockers. Um, and I just put a picture of a few different write blockers that I've used uh, over the years. Um, by uh, the, the ones by Tableau are great. Um, I use one from Weeby Tech uh, that looks a lot like uh, like this one. This is Forensic Culture Doc. I've been using that for years now. It's it's, a, it's been a great piece of hardware. Um, and then on my forensic workstation that I have at work, um, I've got one of these Tableau. Uh, it's, a, it's called a Forensic Bridge. Um, it's a write blocker. 
It's just meant to be integrated into the, the case of your workstation. There are also software-based write blockers that, that can be used and that I've used frequently. Um, most of them, in my experience, make changes to the registry settings uh, within your system that prevent any writes being made to anything that's connected to any of the USB ports on your system. Uh, those are great, but you have to use this with an abundance of caution and make sure that before you connect anything to any of the USB drives on your system, that you test those USB drives with another, you know, just a, an external drive or a, a dummy thumb drive that you have laying around, you know, just drag and drop a text document and try and throw it on there. And if your system doesn't yell at you and tell you that, uh, that you can't write to that drive, um, then you're not right blocked. So you need to make sure that you make those changes again. Um, that's, that's why I like to use the, the hardware based ones uh, as much as I can. Um, but sometimes the software based ones are, are really convenient. Um, so I do use them, but I'm really, really careful with them. So we did the analysis, the acquisition and analysis of our forensic image now. And uh, I talked about the forensic tools. And then what I wanted to do was, you remember that document that I showed you was here that had the drive serial number. So you can go in and you can look at the registry on your own system and you can find that information. So I'm gonna, again, navigate away from the uh, PowerPoint here and I'm gonna show you how you do that. So I'm gonna pull this text document back up and then I'm gonna go down here and just say run. I'm gonna run regedit. And of course, you're talking about your registry, so it's going to make sure that you are comfortable with doing this. If you don't know what you're doing with your registry, uh, I wouldn't recommend that you not mess with this. Um, because if you make changes in your registry that you aren't real clear about, um, you can you can brick your whole system. Um, it, it can it can have it can be really ugly. So all we're going to do here, we're just going to go to the system hive within the with, we're within the HK local machine. We're going to go to the system hive. We're going to go to the current control set and to enum. Within this hive, there's a USB store. And within the USB store, now I've not connected a ton of USB devices to this system. Um, a lot of times you'll, you'll find dozens, if not hundreds of USB devices that have been connected to a Windows system. But within this, it will give you the name of all of these uh, devices that have been connected to this. So what the one that we're dealing with is the Kingston, right? So there it is, Data Traveler 2.0. If you look and you open that up, it'll give you some information, but right here, this unique number that it's identifying that as, It's the same as our serial number for our USB device. So right there is your evidence that this USB drive has been connected to this computer. Now, that of course is gonna lead you down the rabbit hole of okay, well, when and uh, what, which users were logged in, which user profiles were being used when that was done, um, you know, those are all, questions that uh, require a lot more detail. You can go into the, the MRU, um, you can find evidence of that, uh, but that's, that's a bigger conversation for a different, uh, a different much longer probably presentation uh, on how to do that. You can teach an entire uh, multi-day class on registry forensics and still walk away with tons to learn. So I can't get into that at this point, but I did wanna show you that within the registry, there is evidence that you can show that the evidence drive that you're looking at or we are dealing with in this, in this instance, this thumb drive has in fact been connected to this computer. So it's pretty irrefutable. Chain of custody, I talked about that earlier. Um, it's worth revisiting because it is so critical. If the chain of custody gets messed up, then your evidence is of no value. It cannot be used in prosecution and it can tank an entire case. And it's worth 
remembering as well that it's not just the physical device itself that you need to maintain that chain of custody on. Once you make an image of that device, that image is also considered evidence because it can be admitted and used the same as that actual physical device. It's accepted as at, by the courts for that purpose. And because of that, it needs to be maintained just like evidence. So chain of custody of that image file needs to be maintained. And that needs to go on until such a time as a disposition order is issued for the destruction of that evidence, because you don't want to just go getting rid of evidence and not have a paper trail that talks about when that happened and why and who approved it. So a disposition order is, is just an order that's issued by the custody, uh, or sorry, the custodian of that evidence. So usually the lead detective and whatever that case is, and they, they can tell you, yes, this case has been adjudicated. Uh, the uh, opportunities for appeals have all been either uh, used, all, used up or, uh, or nobody's interested in, in an appeal because sometimes you know, there, there is no request for appeal um, and the, the evidence no longer needs to be stored. So you can go ahead and dispose of that. Usually it's a period of years before those situations happen. So long-term storage of these image files can, can cause problems. Um, and finding ways to do that can be can be very challenging. Um, when I first started in forensics, uh, we were taking the largest hard drives that we could find and we were archiving all of our images to those hard drives. I still have a stack of uh, dozens of them sitting by my desk in my office uh, that I need to go through uh, when I have some downtime, which is pretty rare. Uh, we've since then moved to some network attached storage. Uh, we've talked uh, to several different people about uh, offsite storage uh, within a data center. Um, where that gets tricky is you're talking about a lot of data, a lot of uh, data sets that have illicit images on them. So those need to be protected. And when you're talking about uh, trying to build in encryption for that much data, and we're talking about terabytes, sometimes petabytes of data that need to be stored, um, then building in the encryption uh, for that and taking the time that it takes to encrypt that data and decrypt that data and building a process for when you're going to archive that data, all of those are questions that have to be, uh, that have to be figured out um, before you go down that path. So it's not always an easy thing maintaining that chain of custody and figuring out what you're going to do with all of this evidence once you've got it. So. That's that. Um, I'd like to open things up for a uh, question and answer. Uh, if anybody's got any questions at this point, uh, please let me know. Um, and uh, I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want. Hi, Jim. Um, if you came across, if you were doing a forensics audit on a machine, that had uh, virtual machines on it. Would that alter how you would go about the process? Oh, definitely. Uh, so the tools that we use can, can detect the virtual machines um, and we can actually uh, recover those and sometimes rebuild them. Um, but that's a, that's a different process than, than what I just showed you tonight. It's far more complex um, than what I showed you tonight. Um, but yeah, we do have the ability to, uh, to recover and recreate uh, virtual machines. And um, if they used um, the virtual machine to attach to say a USB, would mm -hmm. that still leave remnants in the registry? There would be remnants of the USB device. Um, whether or not there would be remnants in the registry of the VM itself, I'm not entirely sure which ones would and wouldn't leave. I know there are some there are some uh, distributions that are built more for security. Um, one of the famous ones is Tails, uh, mm -hmm. and it's you know specifically built for privacy. So it's it's built to kind of remove as much evidence of itself uh, as possible from a system. Um, and specifically with Tails, I haven't had the opportunity to do an examination of a Tails machine running on an, another system. Um, at least not that I am aware of. If it was on there, uh, I'll be completely honest, I missed it. Um, so I don't know uh, what evidence 
would would remain on a system if somebody were running tails on a like a USB drive or an external drive. It'd be a long investigation, I guess. <laughs> it, it would. It would. Um, we kind of joke sometimes uh, that uh, it's it's not the smart ones that we catch. Um, now that's not always true. Uh, I work with some very very talented people who've done some investigations on some very very complex situations um, and successfully been able to examine them. Uh, but most of the time, um, we're the folks that that we deal with that are committing these crimes are they're not usually very sophisticated. Uh, some of them are fairly tech savvy, um, but you know, a lot of times they're they're consumed with filling a need um, that, or with the accomplishment of some goal, and that often doesn't lead them down the path of any kind of forethought about how to cover their tracks digitally. Mm, I understand. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Jim, we have a question here from Josh. Uh, what should okay. the steps what should the steps be for IT support personnel who find illegal data on end user devices, assuming they are in non-metropolitan areas where local Leo may not have uh, digital forensics capabilities? Um, well, the first thing I have to tell you to do, um, and I'm assuming that everybody's probably guessing that I'm going to say, well, call the cops. Hey, um, make sure that you let your, let your, whatever your kind of, chain of responsibility, chain of command, your, your boss, let somebody know. Um, because if you're working in IT support, chances are you're not the person who's gonna make that call about contacting law enforcement, about contacting um, media, about contacting whoever the legal representatives are for your company. Um, so I, I would say that the, the first thing you wanna do is to make sure that you are protecting yourself. You don't want to lose your job over this, um, so uh, don't don't jump the gun on it. Uh, as far as contacting law enforcement, that that is of course something you want to do. I don't want to I don't want to discourage anybody from doing that. But let your boss know about it and work through your company. Um, chances are they may have a process uh, by which they uh, off to handle that, so that they try and uh, protect themselves and the business as much as possible. Um, but then, yes, of course, if 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 your company is not, uh, if they're not going to address the issue with law enforcement, of course, I would, working in law enforcement, working on the cases I work on, of course, I would say yes, contact law enforcement. If you work in a rural area where you do not believe that your local law enforcement has the capability to address these types of cases, uh, the next step I would tell you is to contact your state police. Um, Hopefully, your state police, uh, wherever you are, has got the capability to investigate digital uh, digital crimes. Um, if that doesn't work, then the next step would be to contact the FBI. But with the understanding that more than likely uh, the FBI uh, may not work that case because it may not reach the threshold by which they you know, they can work it. Um, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding, I think, uh, with a lot of people about uh, what the FBI can and can't do. The FBI is not the FBI is not uh, a a huge organization. Um, they're pretty spread out. Uh, they're they uh, don't have a ton of agents that can do this kind of work, um, and they do have limited resources. So they they do the best they can with what they have, but their mission um, is national security, and so they have to put that first. But what they may be able to do, if you're not able to get anybody within your state law enforcement um, that can help you out with that, then you may be able to get a hold of somebody at the FBI that might be able to refer you to someone who potentially can help you with that issue. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, looks like yeah. Shane had, an, had another question uh, yeah. regarding the text and data left in the car. Shane, can you elaborate? I did. I was just curious. So 
I'm imagining a scenario where someone has uh, realized that, that they may be being looked at and so they wipe their devices, but they may not realize that uh, the car, the, does the car collect information even if the device may be wiped? That's really my question. So I wanna make sure that I understand your question. Uh, are you asking if, if I connect a device to a car, like for example, a phone, and it's got information on it that is evidence. Yes. And then I, then later I wipe my phone, you know, let's say I do a factory reset on it. Are you asking if there's still going to be evidence on the car or if by virtue of wiping the phone, I also wipe the car? That is correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So the answer to that is wiping the phone does not wipe the car. Um, Interesting. So if, there, if there's information still on the car, um, it should still be there. And the other thing I'll tell you about the, the car um, and something uh, for any of you security and privacy minded folks that are that might be involved here. Um, if you happen to rent a car somewhere and you decide to connect your phone to that rented car, uh, sometimes depending on the make and model and, and whatever that device is uh, that's running in that car, it can be next to impossible to get your information back off of that car once you put it on there. So your contact lists and anything that goes on with call logs, text messages, anything like that. Um, so if you're privacy minded, uh, just bear that in mind when you rent a car and you decide to connect your phone to it so that you can use your hands free or your GPS or whatever the case may be, because you may not be able to get your data back off of that car. And you don't know whose hands that car might end up in down the road, uh, the training that I went to, they were using, they were using modules that they had gotten from cars that had uh, had been wrecked, and the modules had been removed from the car and then put up for sale on eBay. Um, then they were using those modules to do the reverse engineering, but then also to test their software, and they found information on some of those modules that uh, I'll just say it was interesting. Thanks. That that's actually pretty scary stuff. Thanks. Yeah. Anecdotally, I bought a used car from a rental place, and it came with someone else's contact list because they hadn't bothered to format it. So yes, uh, <laughs> you have to be careful about these types of things. I'm curious: Are there uh, similar write blocker devices for car forensics interfaces? Do you have, do you no, have to worry about question. that when you're imaging the car? Um, so the, the hardware that I use and that I've been trained on, um, is proprietary and as it has, uh, it has write blocking built into it. Um, I'm not aware of any aftermarket or third party, uh, dedicated write blockers for vehicle forensics. And, and I think that that's probably because there's such a huge variety of hardware out there that runs in these cars that in order to build just a dedicated right blocker for that, you would have to have just a massive amount of uh, time to do the reverse engineering on it and then to build all the interfaces for the cars. Because when you're doing forensics on these cars, sometimes it's, a, it's as simple as, as plugging into the, uh, I'm drawing a blank, that is it the ODP port, whatever, the little port that you can uh, get your, your uh, vehicle information off of, you know, like when you take it to the mechanic, mm -hmm. you can plug into that on some of these and you can do forensics that way. Some of them, you have to pull the module out, take the module apart and actually scrape the epoxy off of the main board and, and have you have another board that has copper contacts on it and you have to line those up. Um, you gotta wear like the, the magnifying glasses to make sure that you've got all the little pins lined up with the right spot on the board. It, it gets pretty it gets pretty wild so uh being able to to make right blockers for every situation like that would be a huge undertaking interesting thank you sure so so with that in mind with the difficulty of making right blockers for um, uh, car systems uh, would that then be something that's more of a 
uh, secondary or tertiary evidence that you would look for something else and the the cars forensics just become something that would be more supporting because you couldn't prove that you had the right blocking no because you can verify uh you can verify the integrity of the of the data um with the the hash values um so you can show that it hasn't been changed um because it'll it'll run an initial uh hash value of that data set um, and then after the acquisition is done, then you can run a hash value or a hashing algorithm across that acquired data and show that it matches. Um, and then if you want to do it again, um, just to verify further, uh, you can then disconnect your hardware and then reconnect it, which in theory would result in another write to that, uh, to that data set. If, if every time that you're disconnecting and reconnecting, you're changing the data, then theoretically you would have another write to that to that data set, which would then change the hash value uh, for that data set. So there are there's methods that you can use like that to verify the integrity of that data set. And in, in terms of it being like a tertiary piece of evidence or a primary piece of evidence, that's very, very case specific. Um, so it, you know, if, if you're if what you're trying to do is to prove that somebody was doing something with their phone at the time that they were involved in a fatality accident um, and the phone was connected to the, to the vehicle and you're trying to look for evidence there, well, then that's pretty primary evidence that you're gonna, you're gonna look for. If all you're trying to do is to prove that somebody was in a, a relative area, say you know, within a thousand meters of where a crime occurred because they said that they were on the other side of town at that time that that, that occurred and you're just trying to refute that, well, then that's kind of tertiary evidence. Um, you know, you're not getting real specific with the location of something and there's not really other activity that you're talking about. So of course you would need more than that. You know, you can't really say that somebody's guilty of committing a crime just because they were within a thousand meters of where it occurred at the time it occurred. Um, but if you were refuting a claim that they're making, then yeah, you can use it for that. Um, but then in that situation, it is more, more tertiary than, than primary evidence. Thank you. Sure. So I had a question. Um, yeah. In cybersecurity, we often get down because it feels like sometimes the bad guys are always winning, and you know, as defenders, it's, it's a quite a bit yeah. of a challenge. So, you know, you talked about it a little bit about how sometimes you know criminals aren't that sophisticated, but do you ever feel like you know sometimes they're winning and you're not, or is it more just you haven't found the evidence to analyze? Every day, every day, it's it's a grind, um, or it can be. It's one of the one of the worst things that we have. Um, going on is our is our backlog we've always got we generally operate with a, about a four to six month backlog um, and we have to try and triage these cases as they come in and we, we can't we can't keep up with the, the volume that we have and that that alone is is very frustrating and then to know that we have to dedicate our time to doing that and that there are people who are running child pornography rings and distributing that type of, of material around the world and uh, giving it out to anybody who uh, is either interested in it or will share it back with them or pay them for it, whatever, whatever it is that motivates them. Um, the, the people who are doing that that are sophisticated are not the ones that we're catching most often because we we don't have the resources and we don't have the time uh yeah that's a constant source of frustration um there's a lot of these cases that we could take and if we had the time and we had the resources we could spend them into what we call an enterprise case you know where we kind of try and take the time to find out who are all the people that, that this person has been in contact with and what have they done and you'd be amazed i think at how quickly that spider web grows and how complex it gets. And since we're dealing with technology, we're dealing with the internet, it, it takes no time at all for that to turn from a national case to an international case and go way beyond the capabilities of what we're able to, uh, to handle as a local city police department uh, just within a matter of minutes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy frustrating, um, but you do what you can with what you have. Um, you just keep trying to fight the good fight. You mentioned a, a four to six month backlog. 
I, I think that's something key to, to always mention because we look at uh, things now, even with the most recent uh, Landry case, right? Um, where people were like, why isn't this, this solved yet? Why can't we find this guy? And, and people are stuck in that mentality just from watching TV shows like Law and Order uh, or NCIS. And I, I see Shane, I, I said that just for Shane, uh, Law and Order NCIS type shows where they get the results back in uh, you know 20 minutes and the, the case is solved within the hour. Um, you know, how often do you have to have to just kind of push back at uh, you know the public or the victims or the or in court to say it just isn't that way that I, I, is that something you deal with often as well? Um, we don't deal a whole lot with that in court, um, and usually when we have a situation like that, that we have to try and, and explain the reality of the situation to somebody is when we have somebody who's a cooperating witness um, and they want to come in and their heart is in the right place. God bless them. They, you know, they, they come in and they, they want to give us their devices because they, you know, they say, well, this is um, you know, there's, there's something on here that I think might help. Um, but, you know, a lot of times you're dealing with, you know, a single parent or a grandparent and that's their only means of communication is, you know, often it's a mobile device, it's a, a cell phone. And they need that. They can't, they can't be without it. Well, you kind of have to make sure that you set a realistic expectation for folks because they do come in with those preconceived notions because they've been watching NCIS or they've been watching CSI Cyber. Uh, and they think that you can just grab that information and you know, they'll, they'll just stop in on their lunch break. And then they show up with an iPhone that's got 256 gigs of storage on it and, uh, you, you really have to make sure that they understand that this is not necessarily a fast process and this can take several hours, uh, if not most of the day, just to get the information off of the device and verify that everything was captured correctly. And that entire time, they're going to be without their device. So trying to break that to someone gently and to keep them in the mood to be cooperative with you is challenging. And that's that's where a, a lot of the, I guess that the typical term now has become soft skills. Um, it's a, you gotta understand, I've been in law enforcement for 20 years and we don't use the same vernacular that the business world uses, but I'm, I'm starting to wrap my head around it. Um, but you know, those soft skills of dealing with, with folks and trying to communicate uh, those difficult, challenging things and, and keep them happy and keep them engaged, um, that's a skill set in and of itself. And you know, being able to deal with people is is uh, it can be very hard uh, to to fight against the the Hollywood uh, phenomenon that gives that gives people an unrealistic expectation of what we're able to do. Uh, to give you an example, I I used to be an, an evidence technician uh, back when I was in in uniform and I worked on the street, and uh, I would go out and I would uh, work crime scenes and I would do fingerprints, and I had a lady get very upset with me one evening because somebody broke into her into her house and they did so by throwing a rock through her window and then reaching inside and unlocking the door and she was very mad at me because i would not fingerprint the rock and she said that she had seen on tv that uh that somebody got a fingerprint off of a rock and i had to explain to her that this particular rock had a porous surface and wasn't going to retain any of the physical characteristics that i needed to be able to get a fingerprint off of it and after about a 10 minute conversation, I realized very quickly that we weren't getting anywhere. So I fingerprinted the rock and I didn't get a fingerprint off of it, but I went through the motions and she was satisfied that I had done everything that I could. So sometimes you gotta, sometimes you gotta figure out which arguments are worth having and, and when it's time to just cut bait. Sure, and, and like you mentioned earlier with uh training could be several days or, or weeks or longer for just your active directory or, or registry forensics. I oh, similarly yeah. to what you just said with soft skills, soft skills is, is, I mean, you could spend a lot of time getting training in soft skills and still, you know, do better that, you know, it's, it's one of those things that learning it and some people have comes to naturally and, and other people it's, it's, it's a hard, hard learn. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it, it's a, I think a lot of people would probably be surprised 
in the way that we do our day-to-day -day operations. And uh, you know, Shane, you may already know this um, just from your experience, uh, you know, working in this arena. But a lot of times when we work these uh, these child exploitation cases, um, you know, people have an idea of what it what it looks like when police serve a search warrant um, from from TV. You know, where we all show up in you know, our tactical vehicles and jump out with our, you know, masks on and vests and lots of guns and, you know, screaming and yelling and breaking doors down and doing all that. And a lot of times when, when we do this type of work, uh, we show up in street clothes um, and we knock on the door and we wait for somebody to answer and we try to be as respectful as we can with folks and because we want to have a conversation and when you show up and yell at everybody and, and break somebody's door down and shatter windows and do it all. And, you know, that doesn't really, that's a, that's a good way to make somebody mad and people don't feel like talking when they're mad at you. So, so you got to think ahead about that. All right. Any other questions for Jim? Is anybody interested in how to get into forensics and law enforcement? Because I, I get I have been asked that question a lot. Um, it, if that's something that somebody wants me to cover, let me know. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dan said he'd be interested. All right. So Dan, um, I've got good news and bad news for you, buddy. Um, the trouble with getting into law enforcement forensics is that first you have to get into law enforcement. Um, if you're interested in getting into forensics within law enforcement and not being a police officer, um, my recommendation would be to look at the federal, uh, go down the federal route. Um, there are people that work within uh, the FBI, the Secret Service, um, you know, all the all the the federal agencies that are strictly tech people. Um, they're not special agents. They're, they don't carry guns. Um, you know, that's, that's, not what they're, that's not what they do. It's not what they're trained to do. They're specialists in technology and all they do is, uh, is forensics and, uh, and tech. Um, that would probably be the most uh, direct route to doing that. The trouble with getting into law enforcement within, uh, or sorry, getting into uh, forensics within local law enforcement is every forensic examiner that I know that is a police officer, um, and I can only speak from my own experience, but they were all police officers first. And what that means is that they had to first go to an academy, uh, then they had to go through their field training, then they had to spend several years working in uniform patrol, doing things like writing tickets and responding to radio calls and directing traffic, all the typical uh, police officer, law enforcement stuff, uh, and then work their way into investigations. And then once they got into investigations, then they had to wait for an opening to come available in the forensics unit. And then they had to apply for that with several other people who also wanted that job. They had to be the, the number one pick because there's usually only one spot open. And then after all of that, they can then begin their training that gets them into forensics within law enforcement. It is a long, difficult road and does require some luck. Uh, and the way that I got into, into forensics, uh, in my own experience, uh, I, I really wasn't even looking to get into it, quite frankly. I, my background is in intelligence. I worked in intelligence in the military and then I worked in intelligence within law enforcement. And I had a ton of data that I needed to do something with because it was disorganized and it was siloed and it wasn't of any value. So I went to the guys that I knew who were the biggest, they were the biggest computer nerds I knew. Um, and I was trying to find a solution for this. And the idea that we came up with was a database that we were gonna try and build. Well, I didn't know anything about databases. So I started bugging them more and more. So after it got to a point where I was down there bothering them about three days a week, every week for about a year and a half, they finally, I think they got tired of me bothering them and they said, you know, well, we'll just put him to work. So they said, well, why don't you come over and join us? So then I uh, went over and I, they told me there was an opening. I applied and now I don't work on my database anymore because I'm too busy doing forensics, but I'm not bothering them for help either. So, you know, I, I was a thorn in their side. So they just decided to put me to work. So I, I stumbled into it completely, uh, completely 
unintentionally. Um, it's the best career move I ever made, I think. Uh, I got very, very lucky uh, that I stumbled into, his, into this because I love it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to get into forensics in law enforcement. And that's why I say that probably the best route to go would be the, the federal route, um, because they do have those, those specialized folks. Um, but understand that uh, chances are, if you go that route, you're, you're not going to be an, an agent. You're not going to be a, a cop. That's understandable, but a little depressing. Yeah, sorry. I know that that's, that's not great news. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do. It's, uh, you kind of got to have a, a love for law enforcement first. Um, and then you got to stay singularly focused on getting into it if, uh, if that's your intent. Yeah, so I definitely understand the, the need for a, a law enforcement background. But I'm wondering, does that mean that most of the people who are entering in as um, forensics analysts are therefore not having a lot of industry experience that effectively everyone comes in new and gets trained? That's true in some areas. Um, and, and in my own area, it, it can be true. Now, um, that's not always the case. I, I work and have worked for several years uh, with somebody in a, an agency that we partner with. Um, and they worked for Microsoft. They were a direct employee of Microsoft uh, before they ever got into law enforcement. Um, so they kind of went full circle. They, they worked for Microsoft. They worked in tech. They decided they didn't want to do that anymore. They wanted to be a police officer. So then they did that. And then their prior experience ended up getting them in, back involved with the technology. And now they're a forensic examiner and really one of the best ones I know. Uh, but there's also a lot of folks that don't have any background in it at all. Um, and it just kind of depends on, uh, it depends on where, where folks are coming from, um, and where they're trying to work. So I would say like in more rural areas, yeah, you probably have folks that don't have much of a tech background, um, unless they're hobbyists, uh, on their own in a more metropolitan area where you've got a bigger city then you know, just by virtue of where you are, you probably have a larger pool of folks that may potentially have a tech background. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of folks that are working in law enforcement forensics that before they got involved in, in forensics, they really didn't have a technical background. Um, that's not the case everywhere. And I, it's my opinion, uh, for whatever that's worth, that I think that it, things will change over time. Uh, but I have no idea how long it may take for all that to change because I have seen some areas where, uh, like uh, an area in Louisiana that, that I was in where they had folks working for their crime lab who were digital forensic examiners uh, that were not law enforcement. They were crime lab employees. Uh, um, so there is the potential to be able to get in uh, into law enforcement forensics through that route, but that is uh, definitely the exception and not the rule. So I don't, I don't know specifically where you're located or if there's anything like that there, um, but I hope to see more opportunities like that come along because the funding comes from different places. And like I said before, we're just buried. We cannot keep up with the demand. So I'm not saying that there shouldn't be law enforcement officers who are actual badge wearing officers, sworn officers, that are doing forensics because you always need somebody to go with those folks who are kicking doors in uh, to do that kind of work. And, and you generally, you don't want your crime lab folks to, to be in that environment because they're not trained for it. Um, yeah. But Lord knows we could use the help uh, from folks uh, if, if more crime labs uh, started to staff uh, more forensics, more digital forensics folks. So understandable, thank you. All right, then uh, Dan had a follow-on question. Uh, what kind, uh, what kind of educational background would be required to go the federal route? Well, I'm not a federal recruiter, so I can't speak definitively about that. But my suspect that you're going to at least need a bachelor's degree, you know, probably in computer science or digital forensics. Uh, I would assume that that would be a minimum. Uh, 
uh, to get in the door. Uh, you're also probably going to have to concern yourself with certifications that are going to meet the DOD 8570 requirements. Um, so if you're if you're not familiar with that, uh, take a look at it. Um, so it's it's the DOD 8570, and I think it's the ATI uh, that falls under uh, that the cybersecurity jobs fall under. Um, so take a look at those because uh, there are a variety of certifications that you can get that can meet those standards. Um, a lot of them are from CompTIA or uh, ISC squared. Um, so that's worth looking into. Um, and then if you just look at usajobs.com, uh, or is it .com or .gov? I think it's .com. Um, there will be listings for federal uh, job openings and you should be able to narrow down uh, by agency uh, if you're interested in getting into that. Um, to look for job listings and you should be able to see the requirements for education there. But I would assume uh, that it would be a minimum of a bachelor's degree. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem, Dan. So before I stop the recording here, is there any last questions for Jim? Oh, you know what I did? I had one more slide I was gonna share that had my, uh, my LinkedIn information on it. If you just search by my name, just Jim Wales, um, I'm about the only one on there, I think, with that with that name. Uh, I don't I don't think that the guy that created Wikipedia is on LinkedIn. Oh, there I uh, went ahead and shared your LinkedIn uh, in chat. Then, awesome, thank you. All right. Well, thanks for the the great presentation and the patience with asking uh, answering. Uh, our questions, Jim. I really appreciate it, um, and thanks for you know, uh, you know, getting together with me on, on LinkedIn when I reached out. Uh, appreciate that too, and of course, reaching out like this led to this presentation. Uh, I think we talked what, a couple months ago before we started planning this. So, uh, really appreciate you spending your time with us and uh, just come in and help us out, uh, understanding even from beginners level what digital forensics is. And, and uh, just some of the, the basic tools of, of doing things. And I, I see here Taylor um, mentioned that, that they really enjoyed just seeing that, that demonstration even, that that really helped. Good, I'm glad. All right, well, if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and end the uh, recording here. Mm -hmm.